I learned about the principle of normalization through my contact with um, uh, three leading Scandinavian figures. <coughs> one was Eric Niels Bank Mikkelsen, the other one was Bengt Nielje, and the third was Karl Grunewald. Um, the President's Committee on Mental Retardation uh, uh, commissioned one of its members, uh, Dr. Robert Kugel, uh, to uh, uh, write a document that could serve as a policy guide to the President's Committee on what to do about uh, the institutional scene. Dr. Kugel was my dean at the medical school at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. And uh, he recruited me to do most of the uh, legwork in getting that document uh, together. And uh, we recruited uh, a stellar uh, panel of writers to contribute to chapters to that uh, book. And uh, that included these three Scandinavians who also, at that time, were uh, touring <coughs> the world, giving speeches, and beginning to talk about uh, uh, affording as normal conditions as possible uh, to mentally retarded uh, persons. Um, we, we heard these people speak, uh, um, and... Um, uh, largely uh, because of what they spoke on, you know, all three of these were recruited as contributors to that volume, and uh, and Bengt, well, uh, Bank Mikkelsen um, had had spoken about uh, uh, conditions as normal as possible, but it was Bengt Nierje who, in response to the challenge of producing a, a contribution to the book, came up with the phrase, the normalization principle. Uh, and uh, he was the first one who spelled it out. Um, again, uh, he did it first in a, in a series of lectures that, uh, that some of us heard, um, and that impressed us very much. And, and these lectures were supported by a wonderful illustrative slides that were very impressive. They were showing things that we had never seen before. Um, and um, uh, and at any rate, <coughs> um, uh, they, they each uh, wrote contributions. Benieri wrote two contributions to the book. And, uh, and that was an essentially um, not, not the birth of the of the kernel of the idea, but it certainly was the birth of a written corpus of writing, you know, on the topic. And uh, we made that the cornerstone of our proposals for reform. We, we made the two assumptions. Uh, one was there was nothing that could be done about the institutional scene uh, without paying attention to residential services broadly. Uh, the, in other words, the whole uh, uh, um, continuum of potential residential settings had to be considered uh, when, if you wanted to, to say anything meaningful about what institutions should be like and what their role should be and so on. And the second assumption was that you, you couldn't even do that unless you took into account the entire service system. So residential and non-residential services had to be uh, considered. There were, would be an overarching guiding principle or an idea and it suddenly hit us uh, principle normalization. It is high level, it applies to all services, it applies to all sorts of needy people and impaired people and societally devalued people and so we made that the centerpiece of the of the book, and uh, uh, the book was a big success. The uh, the presence committee distributed it by the zillion, free and, and largely, all over the the country. And you can say 
that this is the book that broke the back of the institutional service system. Um, it was the turning point in, um, uh, in what happened you know, uh, to institutions after that, <clears throat> at least in the field of mental retardation. Uh, so that, um, well, that was the beginning. Now, it's interesting that even in Scandinavia, they had no uh, written uh, um, corpus of material either. And so, uh, uh, can I see those two translations? So, uh, uh, in Denmark and Sweden, they took parts of the book and translated it back into Danish and Swedish because they had no Danish or Swedish literature on the principle of normalization. They had a law in Denmark, but you know, the law is not a good teaching tool. Uh, so uh, uh, they, uh, they retranslated it. Uh, um, uh, one of them, from, from dehumanization to normalization, says one of them says it. Uh, in uh, in Swedish and uh, and the other it's a Danish the same thing and uh, yeah, human management uh, and the total institution and this is the Swedish one uh, so uh, so that got uh, the normalization uh, uh, idea going but but uh, almost immediately. Uh, I began to, uh, you might say, um, try to systematize and sociologize and, and, and scientificate uh, the idea, and I evolved, uh, evolved it in a way that related it to the sociological literature, for example, role theory, and, and to, uh, to the earlier literature on on um, dehumanization and so on, and um, and, um, uh, and I broadened it from emphasis on mentally retarded people to uh, people who are devalued in society, and it could be for, not just for reasons of uh, impairment, but for other reasons as well. So I, I you might say, I universalized the idea, and. Uh, um, and also showed how it can be applied to any human service, really, uh, to any kind of, um, of uh, recipient population. And uh, I tried to, <coughs> to uh, publish uh, articles uh, on that in, uh, in uh, our leading mental retardation journal. I submitted a series of, of articles and uh, the editor uh, lost them or, or sabotaged them, it's not quite clear, uh, but for, for several years uh, they were not reviewed as they were supposed to be peer reviewed and, uh, and when they finally were, uh, the peer reviewers uh, uh, said that this was not a new idea, uh, nothing new here is not worth publishing. And uh, that made me so mad, I decided that I would bypass the, uh, the journal culture and just write a book about it. So I wrote uh, The Principle of Normalization in Human Services, uh, which uh, um, which came out in 1973, early 1973. Uh, which really was a very delayed publication because uh, the uh, Changing Patterns book had come out in 1969. My articles, you know, were languishing uh, there, and so it took, uh, it was a, a frustrating delay, you know, of three years to get um, the idea out in a systematic way. Um, the uh, the book uh, became a Canadian nonfiction bestseller because published in Canada because I had moved there by that time uh, uh, to the National Institute of Mental Retardation, which uh, uh, was um, 
uh, had been founded by the parents organization in Canada. Uh, and I worked there for two years uh, uh, promoting community services and normalization and so on uh, with um, um, uh, very considerable success there. So anyway, <coughs> um, that's a little bit of the of the history. Uh, I also did manage to publish an article in the uh, American Journal of Psychiatry. It's the uh, flagship publication of the American Psychiatric Association uh, on the principle of normalization, how it would apply to psychiatric services. They did publish it, uh, but um, uh, there was a lot of unhappiness in psychiatric circles, of course, and uh, the mental health field has not uh, embraced normalization to this very day. Um, in fact, it's sort of been hostile toward it, and including to its successes, social role valorization. Uh, but it made uh, Newsweek. <laughs> uh, uh, they ran a news artic article on it, uh, headed something like, is basket weaving harm harmful, or something like that? Uh, because I'd said something in there about uh, the psychiatric institution engaging their residents in, in, uh, in activities that at one time were culturally normative, but they're no longer encountered in the culture. They were sort of uh, uh, anthropological museums, including uh, putting people into OT to, to weave baskets and stuff like that, you know.